Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of Adam Green and myself and Mel Clark, thank you for joining today. Um, this is a, a session on, from the Supply Chain Safety Leadership Group. And we're going to talk about significant risk. Um, if you were at Engagement Council last week, you will have heard Mel and I sort of give a, a little bit of a, a warm up or a taster to what we're going to hear today. Um, we're going to get a lot more detail on what we talked about last week um, and we'll cover a little bit um, if, if you missed Engagement Council last week about what we're um, doing in this significant risk space. Um, as Theresa said, um, we're recording this session. If you've got any questions if you, uh, as we go through it, if you could put them in the chat, that would be great. And Theresa will sort of moderate them and we get time at the end, we'll, we'll sort of address some of these questions um, as we go, go through. Um, but thank you for attending. Um, we're going to hand over now to Andrew Cox, who's going to take us through um, the webinar. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Andrew, you're, you're on mute. Thank you, Adam. That's a good start. Uh, can can you see the presentation, Adam? Is it up on the screen? It is. Good. Super. Then I will start. Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Andrew. Um, today, hopefully, yes, we're going to give you a bit of flavour, uh, a bit more detail around <coughs> what we mean by significant risk and the change, most importantly, uh, that we believe is required um, from the top of the organisation all the way through. Um, to, to do what we're looking to establish here uh, is going to require change, uh, investment and, and thought. Um, so it's great to be able today to um, launch what we're doing and give you all a bit more detail. We do have further technical uh, webinars to come, uh, giving much more detail on how we can do certain things, how we can create leading indicators, etc. Uh, and that's all to follow. So yes, my name's uh, Andrew Cox. I'm the Health Safety Environment Director for um, FM Conway, and I support um, the Supply Chain Leadership Group on this initiative of significant risk thinking. And today, as I said, I'm going to run through uh, some details. I'm going to put in a few sort of bits of interest and points of discussion uh, and some possible changes that we could make and do differently. So really interested to see what your questions are in the chat uh, and maybe the thoughts that it invokes as we go through as well. So. A little bit of um, health and safety journey across RIS2, uh, there's been some real, really good successes uh, in terms of performance, uh, traditional performance in um, in our health and safety performance. There's some, some great figures on, on the screen here that you can see. Uh, Riddles are down. We've had a best of 0.05 in the supply chain. Our lost time accident rates um, have been a low, as low as 0.15 near misses. Uh, and um, unsafe acts, unsafe conditions have dramatically improved reporting. Our utilities are down as low as 0.21 this year. Incursion monitoring and reporting has increased across national highways. We've been doing maturity modelling, behavioural safety programmes, and obviously we have the home safe and well six focus areas. I think what I'm going to start with and, and sort of say is uh, we've had some um, incredible success there in terms of numbers, what I would call traditional numbers. Um, but what do they mean? Uh, what does a riddle rate of 0.05 mean? What does a, a Litfer rate of 0.15 mean? That, does it mean we're safe? Uh, does it mean we're we're lucky? I don't know. How do we how do we halve a riddle rate? How do we actually go about halving a riddle rate or having zero riddle? Should should zero riddle be something we actually aspire to? Um, it's not something I aspire to, um, but I know many of you will. I think, sadly, in the last sort of uh, number of years across national highways, even with the success you can see on the screen, uh, we have sadly had some tragic fatalities within national highways portfolio, even with all this success that we traditionally have. And that got me and the safety leadership group thinking a little bit differently. How can we celebrate success like we can see on the screen here and still have fatalities in our in national highways and within our industry? Surely that's not acceptable. Um, we haven't truly eradicated fatal or life changing harm from our business, but we spend a huge amount of time on low severity risk. And even when we look at our performance, and this is just a generic performance that I've taken from the Internet. This isn't anyone's statistics, but many of you probably have things that are similar. There are many bits of performance on here, what I call traditional safety. 
um, which can lead us into a false sense of security. Um, a false sense of security in terms of what we're tracing, what we're monitoring, producing looking good indices or LGIs as we call them. Um, having a total case incident rate that is low or how many days we've gone without an accident, um, are they measures we should actually be pushing for? Are they measures that are going to achieve home safe and well? Are they measures that are going to deliver no fatal outcomes? Um, for me, these are what these are LGIs. These are looking good indices. What they're not doing is they're not they're not promoting measures of capacity, uh, measures of things that have gone well. They're just measuring things that have happened that have gone wrong. Um, but we need to answer these questions, I feel. So we need to start answering and looking at our performance measures. Um, should we be using Riddle as a performance measure? Should we be using lost time accident as a performance measure? I think they've been very good from where we are and where we've been and what we started to do, but I don't think they're fit for the future in terms of what we're looking to achieve. We need to answer that question, am I safe or am I lucky? I know I have experienced, and I'm sure many of you have experienced around the call today, um, periods of phenomenal traditional safety success. I know myself personally uh, at FM Conway, we had our best statistical um, safety performance in over 30 years. Uh, and shortly after that, I tragically, or the business tragically, um, suffered a fatality, which we didn't see coming. Um, it shocked all of us. Um, and my traditional safety figure, um, my traditional safety uh, measures were all green. And they were all lagging. They weren't delivering anything. They weren't showing me my true operational risk. I think it's fair to say, though, everything that we've done and has come before uh, around improvements and, and systems and processes have been vitally important and we have needed. Uh, but now I think the time is right for us to be able to make that step change and look forward, start to examine what our true operational risk looks like and see whether we can fix it once and for all. Because we keep getting deja vu, we keep getting the same accidents happening again and again and again. In 2020, um, a alert went out about a roller overturning national highways. Since 2020, there's been 15 more overturned rollers in national highways. So what are we not doing right here? Why are we not fixing these problems? Uh, and we're going to discuss and delve into a little bit more of that as we go through. We're going to look at some of the traditional lead indicators. We're going to look at some of the traditional lagging indicators and see what we can do differently, see what we can do that's going to change. What we need to start doing is measuring um, the presence of actual risk reduction, not management systems, not processes, not another check sheet, but actual things that we've done that will reduce our risk. A classic case and example, some of you've probably heard or seen this before, is um, Deepwater Horizon. Um, I think it's fair to say Deepwater Horizon had a, um, a phenomenal safety record, or as you can see, Steve Newman's there quote, notwithstanding the tragic loss of life of the Gulf of Mexico, we achieved an exemplary statistical safety record. What, what a statement to make, and I think they were in the same trap as well of having LGIs. On the day of the incident, uh, they had a high level delegation, including safety professionals, chief engineers on the platform, walking around and congratulating uh, all the staff on the rig about going seven million man hours um, lost time accident free. All the while, and members of the delegation saw the chaos that was unfolding inside the risk uh, inside the rig in the drilling machine. When those people have left and flown off in their helicopters, I think we all know. Uh, that the explosion occurred and 11 people have tragically lost their life there and possibly one of the largest environmental spills we've ever seen. And all the while we were out there congratulating people on 7 million man hours lost time accident free, while the weak signals were there that all was not well on that rig. Safety alarms, um, overpressure sensors were being ignored by the people on the rig. And then tragically, we've had this incident. And it made me think that we're just not looking at the right things and we maybe have become distracted all for the right reasons, because what we've been trying to do, but not focused on the catastrophic failure that can happen in our business. And that's something I believe we need to do different. We need to think. Because. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we created them. That's why I gave you the example of the roller earlier. We keep doing the same things and we expect a different outcome. It's not going to happen. How many more times are we going to roll out a stand down, a toolbox talk, another piece of PPE, yet further more training and try and fix a fatal outcome or prevent a fatal outcome? 
all we're possibly doing is delaying it a little bit. Um, people's memories lapse, as we know. People's um, ability to keep doing the right thing every time changes. People can be affected from day to day when they come into work. Um, and we're reliant on a human at the end of the day to keep us safe. So that's something we're going to talk about a bit further and, and explore. But for us to do something, we are going to have to do something different. I'm hopeful today is our first step where we're going to start making those changes. And we're going to do something different that will actually bring uh, a corporate memory, a lasting legacy to national highways and the industry that these fatals cannot happen anymore. Even if we make a mistake. So zero harm. Zero harm, I think we probably misunderstood it a little recently. I think um, for me, zero harm, possibly I don't believe it. I, I think not all accidents are avoidable. And you might be shocked to hear that. Um, you know, I think zero harm as an aspiration is a very good thing and a long term goal. But I believe the way we've been using it and we've been talking to our employees about it has been misconstrued and misinterpreted. And there's a lack of understanding. If you talk to many optives about do you believe all accidents are preventable, um, if they're going to talk to you honestly, many of them will tell you that they don't believe all accidents and they don't believe all of them should be. If you talk to employees and optives about do you want to ensure that no life changing harm or fatal injuries happen to you, they get on board with that very quickly and, and do understand what that means. Um, so, you know, I'm not against zero harm as an aspiration, but let's be clear with people what it is and what it means. One, one zero I know I can definitely get on board with is, is zero fatal harm and zero life changing injuries. And that and that's something that we're talking about today. And this group is um, hell bent focused on unrelentingly about how we can stop these things happening and what we can do to make further improvements. Many of us have been using Heinrich Triangle for many years, me included. I was trained all about Heinrich Triangle. You've got, you know, 600 near misses, 30 minor injuries, 10 serious injuries equals one fatality. Um, I've come to the conclusion now, I think that's probably fundamentally for, flawed. Uh, and when you look at uh, Bellamy in 2015 and the report that they published or the report that she published, um, you can see that, that, that there is no relationship here um, that can follow this trajectory. Um, in fact, they published some alternative triangles that look very, very different. Um, if you look at, say, stuck by, struck by moving vehicles, uh, probably one of the largest risks in national highways, it only takes eight recoverable injuries, four permanent injuries to create one fatality. That's very different from the 600, 310. Now, in my business, I at one point was tracking possibly 1,600 slips, trips, falls every single month was coming through my near miss safe observation system. Um, but how many slips, trips and falls do I have to have before the two or three uh, contact with moving machinery near misses that I find in my data uh, that I haven't managed to fix because I've been fixing 1,600 slips, trips, falls, slip through the net and I have a fatality. So I began to learn that that's not something there's, there's a relationship. I think it's fundamentally flawed. And, and today we want to show how we want to turn that on its head. And we want to turn that triangle on its head and look at it in a different way. We want to focus on fixing the safety barriers, the problems with preventative barriers around the high severity, high potential incidents. And that's a simple change that we could all make in our business. That's not new data collection. That's not changing anything. That's just reading the narrative of what people have reported and understand what is the actual outcome that's going to cause the life changing harm or fatal incident rather than it being a slip, strip and fall? Uh, which may be on the level across a yard, may, may ultimately be a riddle. That might be the worst thing that's going to happen to that individual. And so be it. We, we spend a disproportionate time on that because it is a riddle. We've created this problem, but maybe we shouldn't be worried about that too much. Yes, it's important, but we haven't got a bottomless pit of resources, time and people. Um, maybe we should be focusing on the two near misses where there's a piece of guarded machinery that's lost its guard and people could get an entrapment injury. We should be focusing on that high severity. So there are some simple things that we could do to change, to do things differently. Because where where does it fail? Um, for me, I think it's, it's quite simple. It fails, fails with me, it fails with humans. And do you know what? I'm OK with that because I am a human. I'm not a robot. 
Um, I am going to make mistakes. Um, I even know just walking up the stairs occasionally, I stumble. I'm not doing that on purpose. It, it happens. Um, I might come to work upset, annoyed. Uh, I might come set up unwell. And all these things could affect my performance. But all the while I'm relying on a human to save lives, the only control measure I've got is a human doing something, maybe with their training to protect us. Surely that's not good enough. Surely that's where our work should be as an industry to make those improvements. Let that human, we've talked about it before, fail safely or, or we say to critical controls. You know, I want to get to a position that we don't have to tragically learn from fatalities like we often do. Let's let that person who got themselves in a situation that could have led to a fatality, let them fail safely. And then we can all truly learn and become a true learning individual, a true learning organization. All the while we're focused on individual behaviors of people, I don't think we're going to succeed. And I think we're missing a trick here. And, and I know many from the core are moving to look more at human factors and maybe looking more at things like human error. There's definitely work that we can do in human error, taking out human error either on machines or, or driving or operating to avoid high severity incidents. And let's focus there rather than on the individual failure. Let's look at the human error. Let's start to focus on the organizational failure. Because here's an example of how um, fatal, fatalities rise in our business. We're not planned for. We don't expect them. And when we plan work, I think we all do. We plan work very linearly. I'm going to I'm going to turn up at eight o'clock on Monday. I'm going to resurface this road from Monday to Thursday uh, and then I'm going to finish. That's how we plan work in a very linear manner. But we all know the reality of work goes up and down all the way across that week. One minute we're ahead of program. Then the next thing we're behind program and we're changing constantly as we go through up and down, up and down. And all the while this is happening, we're trying to bring our program back to that linear line that we've set out for our deliverables. But at the same time, we've got hazards rising from the workforce. So I'll give you an example. It's on National Highway's um, own work, a, a site that I visited. We were we were busy surfacing the road uh, and we were planing out materials and we had a queue of lorries behind the uh, planer. Um, and at the back of the queue, we had a JCB 2CX working away. We accidentally overloaded one of our lorries, so it had too much to go on the live carriageway and we had to tip off some materials now. So now we've got the risks rising to tip off the materials. We have to tip the lorry and we have to let some material off so we can get it below its weight, safe weight limit to send it out on the carriageway. As we did that, the, the back of the tailgate blew out because the load shunted and the whole load, 20 tonne, went on to the carriageway. At this point, we're now having to radio up the uh, two CX is at the back of the job to come to the front of the job to be able to load another lorry so we can get back to planing. So all of this is change. None of this is planned for. And this is how fatals happen. They happen in that change. And we all know that. So I'm now having to bring a two CX from the back of the job coming through all the traffic, through all the other people in the working areas and the risks are rising. And what we need to do is this is where those fatals exist. And we need to build layers of protection, safety critical controls, and you probably need two of them per hazard into the business so we don't have a coming together of the event and the work reality, i.e. we could have had that 2CX um, reversing over one of our planer operators or one of the screwmen, etc. So those risks rise and they change as we go along. But all the while, we are trying to get back onto our linear planned work. But that's not how it works. And that's where this strategy needs to sit. We need to build in those layers of protection from the hazards that are rising from the workforce so that should an event come together, we have an opportunity for it to stop. We have an opportunity to fail safely, an opportunity to truly learn. Why did that happen? Why did why did we do X, Y and Z? If we don't do that, we're going to keep repeating the same things that we keep repeating and we would report another reversing vehicle fatality. So our aim is to build those strong defences. And, you know, and there's a couple of quotes on the screen here. One there I find really interesting. How many operations do we have where a worker is the only defence against their training or that they do the job right every time? That's where the work is. That's what we've got to go and do differently. That's that's where this strategy fits for me. Go and understand that in your business. Understand where you're reliant on a human to save a life. Make a list. That's what we've done. 
And when you've got your list, that becomes the work, that becomes the leading indicators, that becomes the change that you need to make in your organisation to truly fail safely. So when we go to sleep, we have an ability for capacity to happen that we will get looked after and we're not reliant on that human. Because humans will fail, um, and they will. A critical risk control should be there to protect us. And we would need two safe critical controls unless you can lay your hat on. You've got a fail safe. Obviously, fail safe. It will work every single time without failure. That's mainly going to be elimination of the hazard. But if you can't get elimination, we're going to need two safe critical controls because things don't work sometimes and you need a backup. That's no different to aviation, putting men in space. They have a backup system on the backup system on the backup system. We need to do the same. That's where we can innovate. That's where we can change and that's where we can make a difference. So as we um, released last week at the uh, at the engagement council, we've got significant risk and we're just going to talk now about why we've picked what we've done uh, and how we're going to approach that whole process of managing that significant risk about what we can do differently. So as we've shown on our, um, last week, we've got a we've got a vision. Our, our vision is quite tight. It's quite narrow um, and it unrelentingly and we so it's unapologetically are going for significant risks throughout the complete life cycle of National Highway. So that's including design, um, main build, operations, removal. Uh, and we're looking to remove fatal risk by 2032 and life changing harm around occupational health by 2040 by only using elimination, substitution, isolation or engineering control. So we're going to explain what we mean by that as we go as we go into it a little bit more. Um, and we're doing that for a reason, because we continue to kill the same way we have killed for the last 30 years and we're not doing anything different. We are pushing on with programs and I've done this. I've done a health and safety program, tried to deliver Vision Zero in five years. I failed to deliver it. And then what do I do? I go and do exactly the same again, revise the program, redo the training, and I expect a different outcome. But I think it's time that, you know, we stop that and we start to think about truly fixing it. I said, all that work that we've done, we should continue to do it. It's incredibly valuable, but we need to do something more. And this is the more I believe we need to do. But to do this, and most fundamentally, we're going to need your support on the call today because we're going to need to change systemically how um, organisations run and operate and how they manage their risk in their business. How do they look to eliminate, isolate, substitute, engineer risk in their businesses? And that's going to require change. That's going to be the hard bit. This is, this is the bit that's different because we can't continue to celebrate success while people die the same way they always have. And that's why our vision is unreservedly focused on the significant risks uh, that where we determine by our risk profiling, which we've already done, um, to eradicate them from our businesses wherever we can. And we've got our nine, nine significant risks. So what's different? Um, we said we would tell you what's different and, and we wanted to do that. So the first thing I want to say is what we're, what we're going to propose here is not for every risk in your business. It would be unsustainable. It would be unaffordable uh, and you wouldn't have a business, a profitable business at the end of it. So we are only advocating this for your most significant risks where you are most likely to have fatal harm. I know there's about 20, about 21 fatal risks in our in our industry. We're focusing on nine and that's based on our information, intelligence and the profiling that we've already done. They are the nine most likely areas where fatality is going to occur. In terms of your businesses, though, and we're going to talk more about that, there may be other areas in your business and other hazards um, that you would have in your profile. You might only have four of the um, significant risks and there might be others in your business that you would want to focus on and think about. But where we've been traditionally, we've been looking below the line here where my cursor is, we've been looking at behaviours, boss with a triangle, PPE, administrative controls, yet more check sheets. Uh, and we spend a lot of time down here, an awful lot of time down here. And we showed that um, last week on the um, bow ties that we've done, all on the mitigative controls. Why, why do we do it? I think, to be honest, it's probably what I was trained to do, where I felt comfortable in, something I could do really quickly and feel like I was having an impact. It was also cheap. Um, it's also easy to do. Um, but the elements of above, um, where we're talking above the line, are a lot harder, will 
take a lot more time, could take you years. This isn't fixed in weeks. So we're proposing that we, we manage operational risk differently and all the while we need another eye on leading indicators that could take you could take you four years investment program to change a piece of plant or a piece of equipment. This these won't be necessarily quick gains. There are many things out there, though, we can do. And I'm going to show you some examples uh, which are cheap that we could do and should do now. And I don't know why we haven't, uh, me included. So we want to get people to go above the line and we want to focus wholeheartedly on any significant risk. If it comes up in our business and we can see it in our in our reporting and our dashboards and our information, the, the corrective action needs to be above the line. And an above the line correction means it will work without human intervention. That is the fundamental difference in what we're doing here. We want to go for an engineering control all the way through to elimination. And ultimately, we'll have two safety critical controls in place unless we can eliminate, which is brilliant. We will remove. But that does not require a human. And that's got to be clear on that. That is the fundamental difference we need to do. So we need it to be different. We need to look again. Also on our hierarchy of intervention effectiveness, again, we have been focusing on the people focused controls. How many times have you released a new policy, new rules, a new reminder, a new check sheet, a new piece of training? Has that actually delivered the change you wanted? Has that check sheet always been completed correctly and diligently and properly? I'd hazard a guess it's probably not. And I know in my business it's not. Um, checklists are often tick boxes. We can change that. We can do things with that, though. Um, and we want to see how we can get those elements above the line again. And we want to get into systems focused. So we want to talk about standardization, simplification. I bet many of you have thousands of documents in your health and safety management systems. I would hazard a guess half of it there um, to protect the corporate entity. I think it's time we got braver, got simpler, simplified our management systems, make it easier for people to comply. I know when I go and audit my management systems, we do it every single month and we do it on our significant risks. I know that out of 300 inspections that I do and audits, that only a handful achieve 100%, which means that only a handful of my sites believe they're following my safe system of work. A lot of that's to do with the complexity dot in the eyes crossing the T. So how can we make it easier for people to comply? We can do things differently. We can look at different things in our performance. How can we go through to that forcing function at the very top, giving us our most effective controls? How can we force function to ensure that systems make things happen? There's lots that we can do. And again, I would suggest that we only do it on the most important hazards and significant risks. Otherwise, again, it becomes unsustainable. So we want to go above the line here as well. And that's the two models that we're working with, uh, with the supply chain leadership group, and that's in our strategy. To help us do that, we've got the supply chain leadership group, and we've got the chair on the group today is Adam, who's gonna speak a little bit later, but also we have a number of significant risk groups already up and running, all of them applying the reverse triangle, applying the hierarchy of intersection and looking at leading indicators, true industry leading indicators that will actually make a difference by mitigating risk, not a management process, actually doing something different. And we've got several groups already up and running and we plan to establish all nine significant risk groups. So we have incursions group headed up by James Holch and we have occupational road risk, our number one risk um, uh, on our on our profile is occupational aerobics. Nick Holt from WJ is running that one for us. We've got people plant interface with uh, Simon Ellison, and that's the next group that you're going to see the most information from. Started in April, we have a trial site started with Simon's team, and they're looking to eliminate people plant interface on the build of a specific job. And we're going to be doing lots of case studies, information, opportunities for change for people, and prove how we can eliminate people plant interface. And lastly, we've just started the occupational health Tony, uh, by, with Tony Slater. We also have a couple of strategic groups running um, to help with the strategy. We've got um, health and safety and design headed up by Ian Spelly because design is still very important. But it's not just design at concept or at the designer stage. It's also the principal contractor, the contractor. What are they doing on plant specification and design of uh, materials and or equipment? There's lots of elements that we can make a difference. With the performance group, um, with Andrew on the call today, who's put together this webinar, and we have um, Vicky 
Glover running our communication group. So we're looking to communicate not only our strategy to the industry, but also what we're doing and the success with the actual mitigation that we're going to achieve via the significant risk working groups. So there's our, our structure. There's a, a whole team of people working and working to get involved. So we have new groups starting. Should any of you on the call want to be involved, please drop your names into the chat. And as those groups come, we'll get the leaders of each group to come and talk to individuals in either in your organisation or yourselves uh, about seeing what you can do to, to come on board and help us with that. OK, I'm going to start talking now a little bit of um, identifying risk. So we've got our risk profile. Our risk profile are the nine on the screen that you can see, our most likely places where we can. I thank many of you on the call today. Uh, I think there's 35 of you on the call today who've helped us get to this point. Without you guys, we wouldn't have done a risk profile of our of our industry across national highways. It's probably the first time it's been achieved as well uh, across such a broad spectrum of supply chain. I think that's a great sign of the collaboration and the spirit within National Highway Supply Chain to come together to do this. Uh, I'm not sure about many other places where this would have happened with such gusto. So we've got our, um, our nine risks that in order of priority from occupational road risk down to lifting operations. There are more fatal risks and life changing harm risks across national highways. I think that's the first thing I want to say. These are statistically what we believe we think it's going to happen. If it's going to happen, it could be one of the others. That's a chance we take with this strategy. We're trying to focus, be pinpointed on what we want and driving change in these nine. As we know, this is where we've seen a big change and we think the risk is there. So to do this, we want today, uh, we want more of you to come on board a risk profile in. And we're going to show you that later in the leading indicator and in the technical webinars. We would like all, I think it's 128 subcontractors uh, or supply chain to have their risk profile, not only for National Highways and the Supply Chain Leadership Group to understand, but it sells to understand for you to start implementing into your strategic approach to managing risk all the way from your board meetings down to your employee forums. What are you talking about? What is important? Maybe you stop bringing in the whole team to talk about a redor, which is as bad as it could have got. Maybe someone hurt their knee and had seven days off work. You know, we would much rather you bringing in someone to talk about a potential temporary works failure that could have happened on the job, because that's where the fatal is going to be. So there's some subtle changes we want to look at and we could see if we could try and do to make a difference. So these are our nine. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can get involved and what we would like from, from all the businesses around how they manage strategic risk how they manage their own risk profile and how we start to manage de-risking of an organisation. And that de-risking will benefit not only your highways businesses, should you choose, it will benefit all of your businesses. I know we apply this across our manufacturing sites, our rail, our, our roads, all of our divisions. It's not just highways for us. We, we see benefit for us managing our safety risk um, with all our people um, in the same approach. And we've done that now across the whole group. So these are our nine. We've made infographics on them. and We're going to start to use these so people can um, quickly assimilate what, what picture it is and what we're meaning to do. Um, and as part of that, we, we've made a change and we've made a change about how we talk about things as an industry and as a business. So I know at my board meetings now, um, we very rarely talk about riddles, lost times, accidents, near misses. What we talk about are significant risk. We talk about things that have a potential, but rather than maybe hear it from me, um, we've invited Adam along today and Adam is just going to speak um, for a little bit about his feelings as a CEO, how he's managed to square the circles, because this is this is different. Maybe maybe it may have been uncomfortable. I don't know, but I'm going to hand over to Adam now about how running a business in this way and what it's meant to him and his board. So, Adam, can I pass over to yourself? You can. You can. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so this is uh, just to give you a flavour of the pretty much two year journey uh, that I've been on alongside Andrew <clears throat> in FM Conway and as CEO of that business and not as chair of this uh, in this forum, really. It's it's more about how does it feel from a business perspective? Um, and I have to say, when we first started the journey, it was <clears throat> it felt like a massive leap of faith. Um, and um, it was a little scary because we were we were talking and, and doing things that actually weren't on our customers agenda. 
we have many customers like most of you on the call have lots of different ones. National Highways represents about 10, 15 percent of our overall um, custom. Um, we have 17 boroughs and local authorities each which demand similar but different things. Um, and, and we were talking about essentially erasing the normal um, sort of currency and discussion around lagging indicators in the boardroom and with our customers. Um, and, and, and that was quite a scary thing. But, but actually on reflection, when I look at it, we never really got a lot of use out of having discussions on lagging indicators in, in any event. Um, we, we, we found it difficult, you know, if the AFR changed or the LTOFR or whatever changed, it was OK, so what do we do? And, and, and when we started using um, the leading indicators, many of which were, were generated from um, Infratech automatically, creating massive volumes of data, um, we had a lot more productive discussions very, very quickly. Um, I guess one of the scary things is that as a board, um, we, we you go from what Andrew calls, I think, looking good indicators, really. So we were patting ourselves on the back with green um, indicators everywhere. And then within a month, we moved to a load of ambers and reds um, around the, uh, the new set of indicators that we had um, around significant risk. And as a board, you suddenly feel very, very exposed. Um, because these are all documented in the board papers um, for everyone to see in the future. Um, and then you compound that in a way. Um, so let me give you an example of leading indicators. And I've talked about this before, and many of you will hear have heard me talk about this, but we introduced a new telematic solution with uh, artificial intelligence in cab um, by Sam Sara. And, and what that did, that then flagged literally hundreds and thousands of issues to us every month. Um, you know, people, drivers smoking or drivers using their mobile phones or speeding or harsh braking. And, and suddenly we had a mountain of data, which was brilliant because we could then coach and create a, 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 a way of coaching our drivers to ensure that they drive in a better way. And many of you've done this already. I think the AI gives an extra level of um, interest, I suppose, um, and understanding around the people. So we are now seeing safer drivers, we're seeing less accidents, we're seeing an increase of between three and five miles per gallon. And it doesn't sound a lot, but we have 1200 vehicles. It makes it makes a significant difference in respect of cost. Um, but we are seeing we're seeing less accidents uh, as a result uh, of that having those leading indicators. But again, as a board, my one of my biggest worries weirdly i was like well how can we prove that we are validating understanding and acting on all of this data because it was so much of it so, so we went from using having green lagging indicators to red and amber leading indicators with a whole shed load of of, of additional data that we had no choice but to review understand and act upon um and um and, and that meant a lot more work um, and it, it was it was quite hard, but I think one of the, one of the benefits was the level of engagement with um, meaningful engagement with supervisors, with operatives, and and those you know us, we, we self deliver ninety percent of everything we do. Um, so so you know it makes a massive difference. But the level of engagement around a leading indicator and around engineering controls really meant that the, the you know the supervisors, the engineers, they all started solutioning. Um, some amazing things, you know, we were fabricating stuff on site to make things safer um, uh, to access the tops of wagons and stuff like that. We had specifically fabricated steps, which the the the, the fitters decided to to go and build. And um, we, you know, and we started then talking about um, we you, it's a different currency. You start talking about a number of, of, of significant risk activities. So we started counting and planning for, you know, we'd have. 30,000 um, confined space entries in, in, in a year. So, so the challenge locally then was, well, how can we make that less? How can we make that 5,000 or 2,000? So the, the actual currency for discussion uh, around the numbers of um, significant risk activities really made for some, re some, some proper meaningful engagement with the results that had a big difference. 
rather than and and, and I'm probably wind a few people up, but you know the, the discussion around a cut finger or a sprained ankle uh, with some of the operatives, they they didn't have time for that. But when you start talking about things that are material to them potentially that they do care and worry about, are you significant risks? They engage more. Um, conversations are, are are a lot more fruitful, and we found that. Um, so the whole of the workforce that we have was starting to engage the feedback we had, the proactivity levels of proactivity were were amazing. So so I, I think from my perspective in I guess in in a, in Pracy, it's you do need to take a leap of faith. You have to be in a position where you know you're going to have to work harder because you're going to have you're going to potentially have more information. And if and, and if you do the right thing, you'll get automatically generated leading indicators that give you more information and we can do that with infratech now uh, whether that's smart cameras or something different that helps you guide and ensure a safer environment for for your people um and, but but in itself that causes an issue because you have more work to do as a board as directors as supervisors etc there is more to do but actually it's worth doing and we found it's made a significant difference in our own business with the level of engagement um you know and a deeper understanding about the things that really matter to us so so i think for, for that's as a ceo i think from a from our the perspective of the chair of, of this forum um I, you know we've come a long way and this is a really really important part of our evolution now is to try and is to try and enroll and encourage people to start thinking in this way so we can then get more sort of fruitful information from from across different even across different sectors and many businesses that we can start to work with analyze and help improve ourselves and tackle some of the big issues around uh, significant risks that we face as an industry we have engaged with many people and 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 and, and we spent probably the first 12 months uh, of my tenure um, actually developing the strategy and engaging with many many um contractors consultants uh, customers uh, even the, even the hse we had a brilliant um conversation meeting a set of meetings with the hse um so we've really done everything everything we can to socialize this and to develop it in a way that suits um, our industry um so so you know hopefully what you see and you hear um in this in this and other webinars and other engagements we have, we, we have you know you will understand and 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 you know understand that, that we, we have done a lot of groundwork and there is you know a lot of work that sits behind this to hopefully make our lives a little easier uh, when we come to implement this but but like anything new um it takes a lot of effort um to embed in in industry in each business so there will be additional work to do, uh, but from my perspective, running our business, um, it's been worth every moment. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I really do hope you can all join us on this journey and you know, we can collectively make a huge difference um, as the national highway supply chain, you know, and in other sectors, wherever we might work. Um, Andrew, that's all I had to say, really. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. And um... Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning the HSC there because I think I found it interesting after that conversation that they have similar ideas uh, and they are running in the background at the moment uh, looking at um, how they could look at this performance, how they can look at alternative construction methods to reduce material risk on site. Um, it, it was a bit of a moment where they're like, yeah, we're, we're doing this as well, but you just haven't seen it yet um, mm -hmm. moment. But they were really pleased with what we're doing and asked us to spread it with as many people as we could. Uh, hence um, something that we're doing right now. Um, thanks for Adam. I, might, I may come okay. back to you later on performance, if that's OK. Yeah, um, yeah, cool. because, uh, I suppose I want to talk about maybe reds OK as a colour um, as we move forward, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. OK, so wanted to talk a bit about the, the reverse triangle again because um, it's fundamental to what we're doing. So this is what we're going to call um, significant risk thinking. So we need to think differently. Should um, a significant incident happen in your business that's related to significant risk, if your team have come back with corrective actions and close out that are all below the line, I think it would be worthwhile maybe sending them away and ask them to have another look and see how they could get you above the line. What could we do differently? Because we can't keep doing what we do. We can't keep doing the same things. But 
I wanted to just show you a few examples of um, what can be done. Some things cost money, some things cost hardly anything, uh, and some of, some of it's low hanging fruit. Um, so I'm going to go through an example of elimination, substitution, isolation and engineering. So you can see what we mean by the control measures that we're looking to bring in. So firstly, looking at elimination, I've got a couple of um, short little videos to show you um, and I'll, I'll try and give you a little bit of context about them. So the first one you can see on the far left is something called CamScan. I think some of you may have seen it before, um, but it's something that you can use in your industry to do certain types of surveys of um, manholes. So it's something that you could introduce. Uh, it comes at a cost, um, but if you can get productivity and you can get clients, and this is where we need to work with clients like National Highways to issue work in a productive way, this actual device could be cheaper than sending a two-man team down a hole to do a, a survey of that manhole down to invert level. So here's a, here's a simple elimination. So this one machine in, in my business has taken out seven and a half thousand confined space entries. So that's Seven and a half thousand entries that I would do every year on this type of work, um, where now using this machine, I've eliminated. I don't have the risk of someone not checking the gas detector, someone not clipping on to the harness, someone not testing the atmosphere for five minutes before we're going in. All these things I'm reliant on a human to do are absolutely critical controls to keep people safe in confined spaces. By changing the way I work, I can eliminate it. So this is the machine, really simply, it sets up on top of the hole, it goes down, um, taking those photographs, um, and then from that we make our measurements and produce the report that we need to do on the size, the scope of the manhole, the invert level, et cetera, et cetera. So this one simple piece of tech, this one did come at a cost, I believe it's £35,000, so it's not a small investment, but if you can get your work issue we actually increased our productivity this one machine was able to survey 30 manholes a night compared to my traditional team which could do 14 holes so we got a productivity gain here's another one that we found and you've probably seen this on linkedin but i just thought to myself how simple 22 people a year die falling off step ladders in uk 22 people traditionally Yes, people might be using podium steps, but we would have gone up step ladders and we would have bagged off street line columns. A real simple, easy, cheap way of eliminating working height, the biggest killer in construction as a whole uh, in terms of a safety risk. Obviously, I know there's occupational health risks that would outweigh that. But for me, so simple, so easy. It's this kind of thinking. This is the challenge we need on accidents and what we can do. This one is from Costain, again, Fabulous idea, using drones to go into confined spaces and survey, uh, meaning I don't have to send people into confined spaces again. Mistakes do happen. Something we've done um, going into bridges, we use one person going in with HoloLens. So then we then stream back live all the information. So the other five people who needed to go in there now don't have to go in the confined space. So not a perfect solution, but I've got one person going into confined space instead of five. So there's things that we can do, things that we can do differently. These are elimination ideas. We have signs. Every time we have to go out um, and check out a sign is in place in statue. That's exposing people to occupational road risk, people plant vehicle interface. But again, it's why this technology is from HRS. Great piece of kit, and it lets us know the presence of the sign and that it's there and it's still upright. What an easy way to stop and reduce exposure to uh, live lane working. We got some work that was done, I think this was on the A14, um, which eradicated the use of um, banksmen being needed. Um, the most likely person to die of reversing vehicle injury. I think we all know that, but we keep putting more banksmen out there. And, and they've gone with this new 3D machine controlled system and it reduces the risk of that happening. Again, it's these ideas we need to multiply. And as Adam said, if we can get more people doing it, getting more thought creation from all the clever people on this call and across our businesses, I think we can really open up that can and, and come up with some amazing ideas how we can truly reduce risk and mitigate risk. But at the same time, many, many of the changes that we and others have made come with carbon reductions, come with cost reductions, come with productivity gains. This is good business sense. This will work across your business. It will make you a high reliability operating company, making sure that your costs are lower. Yes, there might be a bit of spend to, a bit spend to save. Here's some examples of some substitution. So still working at height, but 
we used to go climb up on vehicles. We would be on step ladders, et cetera, to do inspection work. Again, there are bespoke platforms out there for all different types of vehicles. I know I have this in all of my workshops now. Do you do you have this? Do, are you using this out on your sites? Have you how how could we bring this kind of tech and this kind of solutionism to places where we can reduce and mitigate the risk of working at height by having steps with full edge protection segregation? On here also is a now double award winning. Unfortunately, I didn't ask Chevron to uh, put this video up, but hopefully they don't mind. Um, but the work they've done with Enhanced Mobile Crozier, last week I was delighted to see they didn't win just one, but two awards at National Highways. And this for me it was fundamental. The, one of the most dangerous things we all do in National Highways is put a man or a lady in a vehicle, IPV, while we put out tapers to be struck up the backside by a truck or a car. One of the most dangerous things we do, we put a person at risk. I'll be honest, National Highways with the traffic officers do it without a cushion. How can that be right? These are the changes. These are the questions we need to ask. And this piece of tech, I'm not going to read everything on the slides. I'm going to actually just show you a little video of it in action, because I think fundamentally it's helping deal with. It won't completely solve, but it's going a long, long way to dealing with one of the biggest concerns I have as a safety professional. And that is putting people out in live carriageway with just an IPV to protect us. But have a look at the video. Um, so it's convoy working. We don't need to use traffic officers um, for this. So it's developed by HRS and uh, Chevron. So it's a, um, a, ro a rolling block effectively, but it comes with um, no requirement for a support, as you can see. And we do just put out some advanced information. Then we can install the taper in a safe environment. Again, we all say it constantly, most dangerous thing we do. The system is linked um, to maximize working windows and up to, I've read, up to one and a half to three hours additional working window. What could that do for our productivity, especially when this vehicle can go in much higher traffic counts? Plus, um, for me, it's got the, the linked technology that if a driver has someone go past the block vehicle, we're able to use the alert system that's built in to alert people down the road to move off into a safe place. Everything is recorded and captured. And should we need to prosecute or move forward, we would be able to. The alert will go off enabling our people to go to a safe place while we install that taper. For me, it's this kind of approach. How do we how do we make this potentially business as usual? Yes, we need to check and do lots of things. But for me, that is helping reduce um, the exposure to our people and one of the most dangerous things we probably do in industry. So it's these ideas that we want to just extrapolate and do more of and get them to be business as usual. Again, working with national highways, we want to be able to get these systems approved so we can move forward and do more. I'm now going to show another one. Some of you guys may be running. Uh, we might have talents and others on the call. Electrical panels. Um, I know this is one for my business that uh, going in and propensity for non-competent electrical people to go into panels to try and get machines started again is overwhelming. And they keep doing it, even though we tell them no. So we've tried to look at it, that issue of going into a live panel in a different way to see if we can make it safe. The company asked us to find a solution to allow non-competent personnel i.e. non-electrical personnel, to be able to access electrical switch gear to reset overloads. Traditionally, an electrician would perform a dead test uh, by verifying his meter, performing the test and verifying his meter again. The budget doesn't account for an electrician at every single site, so we was asked to find a solution to allow non-competent people to do electrical resets. We found various devices that indicated the presence of voltage, but they didn't indicate the absence of voltage via a test method. We then come across the Panduit system, which carries out a full range of tests to ensure the absence of voltage before allowing entry to the panels. Most of the devices available don't have self-checking functionality where this device does. So prior to confirming the absence of voltage, it will carry out a test to prove its installation. It will then prove or test for the absence of voltage. It will then check itself again, 
and only if those requirements are satisfied, it will release the interlocks and allow entry. We've combined the absence of voltage device with a door interlock system. So the doors will not open unless the test has been carried out. The device comes with a set of safety contacts rated to seal three. Um, working together with functional safety engineers, we've designed a system which also conforms to seal three to physically prevent people accessing these panels unless the test has been successfully carried out. As part of the false functioning system and design, we've included magnetically coded switches on the doors linked to the under voltage coil on the main isolator, meaning that even with the doors are open, you cannot re-energize. The doors must be closed to re-energize the circuit. As part of making the Latoto process more robust, it puts the step seven part of the tryout into the engineer's hands rather than relying on communication with the operator. Due to production reasons, we need to be able to do these resets quickly and efficiently. Um, this allows us to do that safely. We've just finished the pilot stage um, and had the design verified from a safety engineer, functional safety engineer. Uh, we're now, now that design is verified, we're now looking to roll this out across every single asphalt plant that we have, um, make it a company standard. So that one idea now we're trying to take forward with um, some of our customers on the electrical panels and information we have to install for them on, on bridges and lighting systems. So again, we're trying to give them the surety and risk reduction of their asset so we can take some of these forward as our ideas. And again, for anyone who's got manufacturing as part of their business, isolation and guarding, one of the biggest killers in a manufacturing environment. And it's the work that we can do in these areas that makes a difference. So I'm going to show you a couple of videos here. This is sort of like engineering controls. So, you know, you probably need two engineering controls to um, constitute what I would say a fix if we're using the reverse triangle. But the two I go or the two main ones here, we've got lifting issues. So in in FM Conway, we um, these two devices that I'm going to show you um, have helped mitigate, I would suggest, about 3.2 million manual handling operations a year for my business. Um, and this first one here is something called Transmobile. It's been around for a long time. This isn't new kit. Um, but we use this successfully in on the London Bridge um, as part of some of our works during COVID. And we were going to set productivity versus a mini digger um, laying slabs as a traditional method. Um, within three days, the site manager rang us and said, there's absolutely no point in running a comparison, Andrew. They said, I'm off hiring the mini diggers and I'm going to use this machine to do every bit of slab laying on the job because uh, it was so much faster, so much quicker and had the benefit of see our operatives weren't getting tired lifting manual manual handling and moving slabs so that's the, this is the first one it's a simple vacuum system you've all seen them but i just wonder why is this not moved more why do we keep lifting uh, in manual beds? we found this to be infinitely quicker than a mini digger we did for our, our reactive maintenance i would call this um it's not really a perfect fix because we've still got handling and lifting opportunities going on but we lay a lot of slabs like many of you probably do on the call um and this is partial mechanicalization where we would normally be using two men and a stone magnet or a little magnet those magnets themselves weigh about 15 kilos um, but we are able now to lift 600 by 900 slabs with a single person um uh, without having to use two man teams, we've got a productivity gain, but no enhanced risk of sort of manual hand injuries. It's reduced all the bending over things. Yes, there is still some handling and lifting to be done, but it's massively reduced. Again, those devices only cost us 200 quid, and we've got them in every single reactive highways maintenance gang in our business now. And the last one, I'll let um, my colleague speak through instead. So th actually, this story began probably back in 2017 and uh, originated actually from, from the MPA Awards, 2016-17. Um, I think it was Sabelco that actually demonstrated um, as one of the finalists a detection system that looked at their forklift truck actually moving within a, within a warehouse. It was at that point that from an FM Conway perspective, we were obviously looking for uh, something that could uh, provide the same sort of protections around our loading shovels, but in, in reverse. Historically, 
the camera systems that we had fitted onto loading shovels only warned the driver and only uh, came up on a screen in the cab. Or perhaps it would just give an indication on a light. What we looked for was a system that um, broke that human error element and applied the brakes automatically. The Black Stair system detects both human and object. If it detects an object, it will not apply the brakes to a point where it comes to a full stop. It will slow the vehicle down and the individual can actually sense that, the driver, the operator can sense that, and so they can take the appropriate action before the object's actually struck. Um, from a human detection perspective, that's different because it's a critical control, it's critical at a point where you don't know where the individual is and you don't want to make contact with that individual for obvious reasons, it will apply the brakes full stop. Not only will it come to a full stop, at that point, it will then send an alert um, up into the cloud. It will pinpoint on a map. The maps uh, that they use come from Google and we've, we've all seen those. We can then go into the camera system um, so that we can actually get a date, a time, and a location of where the incident occurred. And then we can, then we can actually download the specific footage. So that gives us an, another opportunity to look at the risk. You know, we've failed safely, we've not struck the individual, we've not struck the object. And so at that point, we can go back and say, well, hold on a minute, perhaps our pedestrian walkways, et cetera, are not where we should have them. We need to make the necessary adapt adaption. Um, we can even coach the individual in terms of, you know, you shouldn't have been in this area, et cetera. We can, uh, we can adjust our safe system of work. What does the future look like? Well, the future actually looks like that once that detection takes place, and we're working with Liebherr at the moment, to actually immediately send a 30-second clip to the responsible person. Because at that point, we're looking towards our ultimate goal, where we are automatically reporting their misses. What we feel it does is, and from the conversations we've had with the drivers, it gives them that extra layer of protection. I've been driving loading shovels for about 20 years now, all different ones. It kicks in, then you stop and you look, sort of thing. You get into habit of like, that goes back, that would kick in before I look all the time normally. So it stops and you go back, you check and you go, carry on going back again. But when you got up a machine, you, can, you can't see everything around you by looking behind. I haven't drove any machines with this level of safety before. One of the things that really excites me and I think is, is, a, is a must if we're actually gonna move forward um, at a significant rate, is the relationships that we build with the manufacturers. You know, working with Liebherr has been absolutely excellent. Um, we have regular meetings with them, we come up with different ideas, goes through to their development team. They give us a time period as to when that's possible in terms of implementation, or whether or not there needs to be some other uh, technology that needs to come to the fore before we can actually put things in place. But significantly, you know, a massive improvement working with, with manufacturers with the same end goal. Same end goal as everyone else has got is preventing fatal or major injury accidents. So those examples are all uh, actually reducing risk and they become the measures that we make. So the loading shovel example, I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, that those three shovels that we initially bought and we've got, we've got six now, I think the seventh one's about to come, it's our standard spec now. Uh, the first three that we bought are um, protecting 3.2 million reversing manoeuvres in my asphalt plants every year. Now, we can't rest on our laurels here when you need to be careful, uh, a word of caution. These are safety critical controls, not fail safes. The machine may not detect and it may not break. So in our asphalt plants, we still have requirements that that area where you saw the loading shovel working is a pedestrian free zone. No one's allowed in that area at all. We still have physical segregation to stop people getting in that area. Uh, and that's the second level of control you need. A combination of an auto stopping, physical segregation, preventing people getting into the area is what's required to make that level of protection. You can't just rely on one control. We also have to be aware uh, and we have to consider as we move forward with this approach about complacency. We cannot allow people to become overconfident with technology, that it will always work. And that's why I stress these are safety critical controls, not fail safe. To be a fail safe, it must work every single time no risk of failure. If you can't prove that, then it's not a fail safe. You need two safety critical controls as a minimum to protect people. So in terms of, um, just moving on. 
So there's some some examples. We've got many, many more. If anyone wants to contact me or others on the group for further examples, we've got many, many more. A majority of these are offering us productivity gains as well, uh, less damage, uh, better maintenance of the vehicles. They come with business improvements across the board. It's not just safety benefits. Obviously, some of these are done purely because we want a safety benefit, but we are finding with this approach, we're getting, most importantly, customer, um, customer satisfaction, we're getting higher reliability business, and we're getting um, we're getting the ultimate safety result that we want. So that's what we're advocating going above the line. There's a few examples of what we mean. So do not require a human um, to make a success. So talk a little bit more then about the um, about the um, loading shovel. So we spoke about automatic near miss reporting. Now this is something as we evolve our businesses, and there's information out there now that I. Hazard a guest you already have in your businesses and you're not looking at, or you may be. Um, there are many what we call weak signals out there. I'm going to talk a little bit more about weak signals in a bit. But in this particular picture, you can see in the bottom right hand corner a lot of red dots. Those red dots are every single time that loading shovel has activated because a human, not an object, because a human is at the back. All bar four of those dots are in an area where humans are prohibited from and physically prevented from going into. So that tells me I've got a problem. So I've got big signs, I've got solid fences, gate control, everything stopping humans going into these areas. The only way you're allowed into those areas is under radio control. You radio, you stop the loan shovel, and then you're allowed to safely access. But I've got 15 dots going off there telling me that my machine has intervened and applied the brakes. When you look at the data, some of them could have easily been a fatality, could have easily been a reversing vehicle um, in, in traditional ways. If, if the gentleman or the lady driving the machine wasn't aware of the person being there, yeah, we could strike them. There is that risk potential. Of those 15 dots, not one of them was reported by a human. And I've got a very good near miss reporting culture in my business. Could it be better? I think it can always be better, but I get circa 5,000 near misses unsafe acts a month. Um, not one of those, though, was reported. And that tells me something. We we can use technology. We can use information you've already got, most likely on your systems, as weak signals. I now know on, we're going to talk about a little bit later about barometers. I now know that this particular site has got an issue. But it gives me something that I can go back to the management team there to do more, to go and do something. Rather than ask them to halve their IFR or halve their lost time accident instrument, I go specifically and talk to them about a problem about non-authorised people going near the loan shovel while it's operating. That becomes the piece of work in the here and now. Obviously, they need to think about more leading indicators for the future that could fix this um, forever. We've now just installed on this particular site an AI camera that is up on a pole, but it monitors that human um, area where no one's allowed to go. And as soon as someone goes in that area, it sends out on a speaker a loud alert. It notifies the plant manager and it automatically near misses me as well. So I can again see actual risk happening there and then because that's the presence of capacity. Not having accidents is, is, is not a good measure, as we've discussed, but I can start to measure the presence of capacity. Where is my hazards rising? Where are my risks rising? Where do I need to go and do my work. So that automatic near miss reporting can be extrapolated across your whole business. We've started taking telematics off of our telehandlers. We're taking telematic data now off of our, our cranes and our hives. I now get a report months a month. I would like it to be automatic, but I'm not there yet, but I'm going to be doing that. Where I know straight away, where well, one of my cranes has gone out to do deliveries, where we've overloaded it whether we've locked out the safety device, whether we've manually had to override it to get the crane working. Have I lifted something without putting my feet down? All that data is on those machines. We just need to go and get it and create links and systems for automatic near miss reporting to tell us about it. Adam mentioned about telematics. You've probably all got telematics. Um, we're, we're automatically pulling speeding events, as you would imagine, all those simple things you can do. But they are your weak signals. That's telling you how well you're managing. My AI camera tells me how many people are wearing their seatbelts, how many aren't. Those cameras now um, also tell me whether someone's covered them over, someone's put grease on the lens, or if they've cut the cables. We now know that. So we can also assure capacity that our systems are working. I don't know how many of you have done an accident investigation. 
gone to pull your camera footage and find out the camera base is corrupt and you can't get it. Think about how you're building your systems and ensure that you have self-check-in, self-health reporting systems so you know that you've got the presence of capacity. Again, as a board, you'd want to know those systems are working and operable. There's nothing worse than having a fatal accident and finding out a safe system that you've put in place wasn't working. So think about how we can change and how we can do things like that. Automatic near miss reporting is going to become a theme. And I think we could all do more as a business because we can create rules uh, on the most significant hazards and the most important controls that we've got. And the machines will report them 24 seven, seven days a week, and they will always report they don't have a day off. We still want the humans to tell us there's nothing wrong with that, but we should complement it with this now as well. And I think that element, automatic nearest reporting, can make a big difference to your business. So I mentioned earlier about reducing complexity, reducing systems and processes. Um, something I think is worthwhile for every business. My system have become unwieldy, too large, too complicated. Um, the ability for someone to comply, I thought, was actually extremely difficult. There were so many layers and different check sheets and permits and training that I would put in across the business, all probably for the right reasons. Or some of it probably to protect us corporately from prosecution or prohibition notices. But we're making it unduly complicated, I believe, really difficult to comply. When I read a safe system, and when we manage and mark safe systems as part of our performance now, we read that safe system and we identify what is the most important things in there that make a difference to that working eye activity or that reversing vehicle activity not happening. It's those activities get scored and weighted the highest. And it's those compliance areas that we look for in terms of our performance measurements. And then as across our business, as I said to you earlier, we do these checks every single month. We look at our most important safe systems for our nine significant risks and we map how well we're doing. And I was surprised to hear, and, and you my guys might not be surprised, that hardly any of my sites were 100%. And all that means is we're actually not doing what we say we're doing. I've got a safety management system, what we're not doing. And some for valid reasons, too complex, too difficult, not a lack of understanding, training, you could say. Um, and equally, people ignorance and not knowing, but that becomes a piece of work. Then that's that's important because the safe system, nine times out of ten, if delivered, will keep us safe. But that's relying on humans. We need to change that. But at the moment, we do need to focus on that. So, see what we can do to strip out the clutter, stop the blizzard of safety information, the blizzard of of training and information that we're doing constantly. Pick out the most important things, pick out the actions that make a difference and focus on them and cut back on everything else that we're doing. Focus your resources on what you've got. You don't have bottomless pits of resources to be able to deal with this. I'm going to talk a little bit about performance now then, and I think performance is really important. And there's there's going to be um, two parts to this sort of this sort of part of section here. I'm going to talk about uh, leading and contributor indicators, and they very much fit on, on one side of performance. So that's your roadmap to success. That's your roadmap to not having a fatality. That may take you 10 years. Um, so that needs to sit for me separately. And then you've obviously, you, you can't ignore the risks rising on your business, but we are looking at LGIs. We are looking at things that I don't think take us in the right places to do the work. So I'm going to talk about leading indicators and and the cert and um, contributors. Case we're going to launch our first one, and I'm going to show you how we're going to do that. But first off, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about performance. So at the moment, we've got we've got lost time accidents, we've got riddle rates, we've got near misses. We probably group them into categories and things, which is all great. Um, but maybe this is an idea. I'm not saying anyone has to do it this way, and I'm not sure there's some some great people on the call who think of better ways to do it, and I'd love to hear them. Maybe we we manage potential risk. Maybe we manage severity of outcome. Maybe we don't manage the actual risk. So when I mean by actual, I've gone in, uh, I've tripped over, I've broken an ankle. And that was maybe due to a small pothole on the ground. Maybe I don't manage that risk. Maybe I, I manage the fact that that accident happened on a plant crossing. So it could have been struck by a vehicle coming down the road. That becomes what I would call it. It wouldn't be a stitch, trip and fall. I would simply re recall that people plant interface and that becomes a significant risk. So we need to look at our data. I think you need to look at your data differently, but read everything. It's all in the narrative. I promise you, you've got all the data. 
And when, when I first started doing this, uh, I read everything, every bit of narrative I could. And I discovered across my one year, I found five fatal risks, incidents that happened in my business that could have been fatals, but were just hidden in the subtext. And that, for me, is something we've continued. We now look at risk potential of everything. And it doesn't matter. It could be a riddle, lost time accident, minor, utility strike, uh, unsafe act, near miss, whatever it is, any one of those could become a, um, a high potential incident in our books. And we will be talking about it. So it doesn't matter now whether it's a riddle or a lost time. It measures. It matters whether we think there is a potential for life changing or fatal harm. So something we're using, something a little bit different, is um, is barometers. Again, this is just what we do. But again, have a think. There's lots of ways you could do this. So we've got nine barometers here for our nine significant risks. The inside semicircle going green, amber, yellow, the small one where my cursor is. That's what we call actual risk. So that's like it was a lost time accident. It was a total case accident. It was a minor accident. So as you will see across the board in this instance, we're pretty much our world is great as I would call it, we're all green. So traditionally, we thought everything was excellent. So if I just looked at an accident rate around incursions, I was like, OK, no one's ever got hurt. I'm green. Lifting operations, yeah, we haven't had any failures. Occupational health, haven't had any ill health reports. So my world was great. But what we've started to do differently, and we started to predict risk, so we're looking to predict hazard, predict risk, is we now monitor all of our weak signals. So all the accidents, incidents, near misses that I discussed, I now monitor near misses. I monitor information on the insurance companies about repairs to vehicles. I monitor defects on chains when we take them back and were people using defective equipment for lifting operations. I monitor the telemetry coming out of my cranes, were people overloading the cranes and we start to score risk. Any one of those incidents could put you in the red. And if you're in the red for risk probability, that means you don't have control and fatal harm is a potential means we, we could happen on your side. So in this particular example, I think you can see five of them are in the red, meaning we don't have control and fatal harm could happen. When we first started doing that at FM Conway, all of our barometers went red, every single one of them. And um, and I suppose, Adam, if you're on the call, maybe I'd suppose it'd be just interesting to hear, how did you feel about when I started first showing you barometers and um, they were all in all in the red? And I was, I was telling you and the ball that, we don't have the presence of control. We don't have capacity. A fatal could occur in the business. Um, initially, I, I, I was scared, to be honest with you, as were the rest of the board. Um, um, but very quickly understood the benefit of having a real insight into what was actually happening out there. Um, so we became very used to, used to it quite quickly in short order. But it did involve doing a lot more and actioning things um um so so yes yeah, so i think no board likes to be presented with a whole boatload of uh red indicators it's not where people want to be especially because they're they're a record uh, in all the board papers for three or four or five six months uh until we started turning things around so it, it yeah it, it's a scary place to be but actually it's a good place uh and looking back it was something we had to go through really andrew no, th thanks for that. Because I knew, I knew, I remember the challenge I had at, at that time. You, you know, mm. we've gone from LGIs, everything looking green, to everything red. And I think for me, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say maybe red's okay. Um, it's not okay. I think uh, maybe I'm, I'm mis saying that, but red's not a bad thing here. Don't, don't, and and you don't have to do it in colours like I've done it. Um, knowing that you've got a problem on a site in a business to do with a particular hazard group. Why is that a bad thing? Surely that's us managing risk, managing risks that rise and fall continuously across our business. That at least enabled our board and our directors to go and act, go and do something. And a lot of our importance is now is on those actions. It's not on the fact it's gone red. No one would be penalised in our business for having a red, uh, a red bromsar. Don't get me wrong, if they're red every single month for the same reasons, there is a problem. But nine times out of 10, it gives us an opportunity for that manager, that director to make a difference. Adam could set a challenge. I want incursions or I want lifted operations into the amber by next month. I don't want to see this. These are some systemic things you need to go and change and parts of the safe system that need to be complied with across your business. It gives us something to go and do. So red here, not necessarily bad. And I would challenge 
pretty much if I came and did the similar approach in any organization, I, I'm pretty sure I'd find the same things. In fact, I know I would find it the same because a question I'm trying to answer, which I couldn't. And when, when I tragically had the fatality in 2017, it was a reversing vehicle fatality over a member of public. It shocked me to my core. As I said, I had statistically the best safety record I'd ever had in my career. I thought I was doing everything right and that I've been trained for, and I still had a fatality. But when I came back from that Christmas break after a lot of thoughts and procrastination, um, I asked a question to the board. I said, how many of you can tell me right now, every single time we conduct a reversing manoeuvre on our sites, it's conducted in line with our reversing vehicle policy? Not one director could answer that call. And I knew they couldn't. Not one director. A couple of brave directors put their hand up and said, I'd like to think it is, but it probably isn't. Some put their hands up and said, it's probably not. And I started to think, well, that's they're the answers to the questions we've got to start answering. We've, we've got a safe system. It's vitally important to keep people alive that we do it. So surely we need to know whether it's working and it's being done every single time. I think I'm a realist. I know it won't happen every single time. We need to find leading indicators and better ways of managing reversing vehicles to protect us with safety critical controls because we will fail one day. But it's those most important things. And that's what I started to think a performance dashboard had to show. Has to show the true operational performance of your business. How many people have gone up on a scaffold or a leading edge and not clipped on? We, we should know the answer to that question. Because those are the things that are going to happen that are going to lead to the fatalities. How many people on a step ladder working sideways on it that could push it over? Again, we need to know the answer to that because we know that's a classic fatal accident. So I started to try and devise ways of looking at performance that answered those questions rather than managing the, the, the absence of something. I started to want to manage the presence of capacity. And that's the fundamental difference on performance. So. Red is not a bad thing. It's about what we go and do after it. I would actually say any business that doesn't have red on it at first probably is not being truthful and honest. There's culture and leadership are needed. It's not on this particular um, graph here at the moment, but something else is really important for me now um, on barometers. Sometimes the outside barometer that's measuring risk potential, the potential for a fatality, sometimes we turn the whole uh, barometer stick yellow. What that means is I have no data. That's as bad as knowing I have got intelligence. Having no data, I don't know whether it's being well managed or not managed at all. It's a place I don't want to be. So we now also report that back to our divisions. You've got no data in this area. So their job comes, um, go do significant risk audits, go and do some checks, go and monitor this, go and pull some data from the machines, see whether you've got compliance or not. So that becomes the work that the business would go and do. And equally, in my servicing business the other day, we asked them to do exactly that on lifting. They operate car lifters. Um, they had no data, had no information on that one lifting thing they did. But when they went and checked, all was not well. And they found out they were in the red. And the, but they didn't know that at the time. So I think that's really important as well when we look at look at data. So that's how we're managing what I call active risk, um, operational risk. We try and look at the weak signals uh, and how they're coming into the business. So we look at all those facets and everything we read, we look and ask ourselves, the safety professionals or people producing reports, what was the worst case outcome that could have happened there? That becomes what we talk about. So. I'm going to move on now to leading indicators. And I, I truly believe to manage this properly, you're going to need two groups. You'll need someone looking at the here and now, the reactive, the barometers, if that's what you choose, management of risk. And also you're going to need a team focused on leading indicators that fix it in the future. But it's going to take more time, more thought, more innovation, more trials potentially. But what I found, like anyone else, the, the, the day job takes over and we become reactive. If you don't create space in your organisation to separate, you'll find that lean indicators get forgotten because you think you can put them off for another day and everything comes about, I'm in the red. How do I get out of the red? Because I've had these um, these breaches against my safe system of work. So what we wanted to do is we keep them separate. So we're going to launch the day. I'm going to show you how the leading indicator is going to work for the first one that the supply chain leadership is going to use. And uh, national highways are going to adopt hopefully into their performance report because we do we want to get national highways and others we're talking about it'll be a slow process away from maybe lost time accident 
IFR being the first thing we talk about, the reason you win the tender. Ultimately, we would like to move over time to a period where it's about the management of the presence of something. What have you done for your significant risk? What have you changed as a way uh, of rewarding and doing tendering and information? Yes, rear doors lost times will be there, but we don't want it necessarily to be the first thing that we talk about. We'd rather you had a performance conversation with National Highways about something you was going to do that was going to truly reduce risk on site and maybe you haven't managed to do rather than say your utility strike rate number, which maybe is counterproductive. So these changes we're asking for, they, they're going to take time and we need to move slowly to make those changes, but we are looking to make that that work. So the first lead indicator we've got is, is, is what we launched last week. So we've got traditional lead indicators often only measure half the journey. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a minute. And they often generate what we call looking good indices. So many of you may think you've got lead indicators. And um, I used to have these as lead indicators as well. Number of inspections and assessments completed. Um, numbers above completed plan. Training days delivered versus planned. Bow ties completed. Percentage of corrective actions remediated. They used to be my measures. Um, but none of those indicators actually um, actually deliver a reduction risk. It's management processes. Now, there's nothing wrong with them. They're actually really important. I wouldn't call them leading indicators. We have all these, but this is compliance. These are must have because in this information are the weak signals. In that narrative is where you find your weak signals for data. If you read them, you'll see them, where the risks are, where the hazards are. So they're vitally important, but they're not leading indicators. It's only half the journey. This, this will lead you to LGIs. Everyone's done their toolbox tools. Everyone's done their near misses allocation. All inspections have been completed. That's great. That's For me, that is just compliance. Um, and we need to move away from that. And we need to answer that second part of the question. So we need metrics that are measurable and quantifiable. Um, we need a relationship between the data and plans. You know, we need what is it related to the significant nine? How is it going to reduce my risk? Um, subjective measurements. We focus solely on management process and not risk reduction. I keep saying it. Um, they're not attainable often, often, and they don't actually reduce the identified risk to appropriate levels. Elimination, substitute engineering. If it's not one of those three, I hazard a guess it's not good enough. And we all need to go and do more and have another think. Now, Sometimes you are going to look at something and, and maybe there isn't an answer there yet. But that doesn't mean we don't come back to it next year and the year after. Something may come that means we can move on. So examples of using leading metrics and here's an example here. Um, so we've got the ultimate elimination of, uh, that we're after or the removal of a hazard. So in this instance, elimination of utility damages with the potential for life changing harm. That's the ultimate outcome that maybe we want to achieve. We need risk reduction measures, and we're going to have a number of things. It's not going to be one thing that does this. We're going to need to build several contributor indicators that will help us in stepping stones get to this point. So it might be all excavations GPR'd, um, temporary supplies are all removed, uh, raising the bar removal, no one uses metal pins anymore. It might be all of these component parts that we use to build and make our ultimate leading indicator. And for example, our first one is. Leading indicator, and, and what we hear chiefly today is the strategic uh, strategic direction adopted and evidence throughout the supply chain and National Highways. So it's not just us, National Highways are looking to do the same. So to do that, and we showed this last week, but we only showed the triangle, but we've got different levels going up the triangle, which are the contributor indicators, which are our stepping stones to get us to the top part here. Interestingly, we've got a whole nother triangle to do around corporate memory not requiring a human to intervene. If the supply chain leadership group disappears, if, if Mel Clark disappears, how does this continue? If it requires us to do it, we haven't done our job properly. It needs to be systemic, the way we work. It's business as usual now. That's where we've got to get to with these changes so we don't keep suffering corporate memory loss. And National Highways are going to help us with that second part of, of this uh, triangle, which will all be about forcing function, we will be using automation, computerization, simplification. It'd be those tools we're using to ensure we get a corporate memory and we don't forget all this work. So quickly go through how this is going to build. What we've got is 128 supplies to be engaged with across um, national highways. We've got an aim to get to 90% before we 
allow ourselves to move up that triangle. So today we're meeting with yourself, CEOs, MDs, operating directors, check um, directors and equivalents on this webinar to start to teach you and talk to you around the changes and things that we need. So as part of this, we're educating you on what significant risk means. And hopefully by the end of today, you'll have a good understanding of what we're trying to do and why it is different. Um, we're going to be producing significant risk templates, risk profiling priorities, Excel sheets, examples and objectives. So I, we're training people how to do this. And we've got the technical webinar, which we've mentioned coming up in May, where we're going to give a lot of the tools out, all, all free and simple to use on Excel. If you guys have got different software and computer programs that can do it, then great. But we want to make sure that what we're doing can be done from the smallest contractor to the largest contractor. So once we get an engagement of, of CEOs, MDs and ops directors and check directors up to 90% of the 128, we will move on. Those 10% who maybe won't engage, can't engage for various different reasons, will move to corporate memory. They will go into a second triangle, which we'll work with National Highways on. So once we get that 90%, we hope to then take you forward on that journey. But the next element we want everyone to do is have a strategic approach, have a strategy in their business that will change the way they operate from board level all the way down. How are you going to be performance managing big risk? How are you going to be de-risking your um, significant risks across your business? And again, we're going to provide example templates, ways you can do it to try and help as much as we can about how can we put um, uh, significant risk strategies throughout your business. And we're trying to get that to run concurrently with this education process. And again, we're looking to get that 90% done so we can move forward and further up that triangle. We're building that foundation as we go. Next, we want to have everyone's done a risk profile. As I've mentioned, 35 of you have done risk profiles. And I thank you for that because we wouldn't be here without you. I've got 128 that we would like to do. 128, I would love you to actually understand where it's most likely to go wrong in your organisation. And um, I had a, a comment back from, from Talent when they did their risk profile. And they, they mentioned that they weren't sure about it, should they do it. But when they did it, they actually identified two fatal risks in their business that they weren't even considering. And I thought that was great feedback from them. They, they've gone through the process. They're a bit not unsure, but they wanted to engage. But they actually came back and said, we actually found some significant risks that we we, we weren't really on our radar. So they, they thought a, a good process. So we want that for everyone. We want everyone to understand what their significant risks are and what their most important ones are. Again, you might have five. You might have nine. I've got 10. I've got nine in National Highways. Yours may be different. But... As a supply chain leadership group, we're going to be focusing on the nine. Once you've completed your risk profile, we want that prioritised for you. And we can help you with that. Again, we're going to show you how to prioritise and we're going to feed that all back into the National Highways profile. And we'll probably have to do this sort of every five years because work types change. Uh, risks evolve differently. You know, we've got a big risk evolving with uh, electrification of plant and equipment. That may feature as a big risk as we move forward. At the moment, it's probably not. But as as our work type changes, we may need to change what our significant risks are as we evolve and we move forward. So, again, we want to build those same people. We're looking to get ops directors this time, divisional directors, contracts managers, check teams involved now with that prioritisation so they all can get on board. Then we're going to move to phase two. So that's phase one in the first six months. We want to then move to phase two and we want to start setting de-risking um, objectives. So leading indicators around your significant risks. And we want to know what they are. And we want to then help and work with people around significant risk performance. I've shown you some stuff that I'm doing. Uh, we would like to do more on this about what does good performance look like? What should we be monitoring? And again, involving the client in those conversations about what maybe their performance monitoring of us should look like. Shouldn't maybe have subcontractor lead tables, shouldn't be monitoring lost time accidents, maybe not accident ridden. Maybe we're, we're monitoring near misses to do with people plant vehicle interface. I don't know. We can work together and we can build what they look like. And that's going to be that second six months. We're going to do that concurrently. And again, we're looking to engage CEOs, MDs and directors. And, and, we, and we say this because those de-risking activities may take time, may need change. You might need to buy things, do things different, make investment decisions. So we need a, a full and round view of that before we have them. We're looking to have de-risking uh, objectives around all of the significant risks. And then we want to track them. They're the leading indicators. They are what's going to make us better. And we're going to hopefully set 
out pathways and that will be supported by the work that the significant risk groups come they're going to come up with leading indicators and pathways and triangles which you will be able to adopt into your business and take forward in your businesses to make that change and finally we're going to be working on that performance piece so what does the board meeting look like what does the check meeting look like what do the employee forums now look like what is the agenda how are we discussing what are we discussing in terms of risk and opportunity how are we de-risking where are the successes you know what does success look like i know in the last year i've i've removed 25 um 25 million risk activities from my business that's what I'm now looking at. That might not be the measure. It might be hours exposed to a hazard. We might do that. But that's got to be a lot better as terms of success uh, rather than saying I'm lost time accident for three years and then bang, I've had a significant risk injury. So let's look at success that we can go back to our operatives and show them what we're doing. Let's look at valued leadership. You know, it's great that we go out and do visual felt leadership and I've got nice PPE on. I'm having lovely conversations with people. But Let's try and share sort of stories about us finding money or funding or investment so we can improve a safety technology or buy a kit, a kit that makes them safer. Let's go and talk about what senior leadership teams are doing there in valued leadership space that we can go back and engage with our employees about and say, look what look what the company's done. They've invested in this. We've made this change and it's going to deliver this level of safety to you. Let's let's really enhance that valued leadership if we can. So that's going to go all the way through and then we're going to have a corporate memory triangle and that's going to be done directly with national highways and that will be dealing with and looking at the 10 percent of people who do not want to engage or unable to engage we need to understand why that is um as well as how do we make it live so where does it live in performance monitoring where does it live in standards specifications changes that the client could make in, in how we have to work where does it live in um the contract in terms of clauses and things that we have to do how does it feed into our performance reviews that we have to do back to the exec directors and stuff as we go through our contracts and what does say risk three contracts look like for significant risk could we then even move into having significant risk awards um to go with the national highways awards that we've done so we're working on that next step about how do we keep it alive and how do we keep it going so we get corporate memory OK, it's at this point I was going to hand over to Mel Clark to um, just summarise what she's seen and, and maybe she gives some views, um, a views yeah. from National Highways would be appreciated. Absolutely, Andrew. Um, you, take a break. Have a drink. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I bet you've got a sore throat after that. Well done. Um, the good news, folks, is I am not going anywhere for a while. It's probably my last job till I retire, so I'm here for at least the next five to ten years, folks. So uh, I'm not going anywhere, so I'll, I'll be retaining a bit of the corporate memory for a while, but I get it. This has got to stick hasn't it and be a thing that we can walk away and leave as a legacy um in all of our organizations um every time i hear you do this um andrew i i, I just kind of think more about how we get a better shape of the scale of the challenge and i think this will evolve as well so we're on this journey this is a really sort of evolutionary thing it is really new the way the approach that we're taking so um so we'll iterate our way through it but it's it, it it's really exciting and I, I genuinely do think this is is the right way forward and and, and as, obviously at national highways we completely support this and we will be creating a charter um, and we'll be expecting as part of that charter um, to set our expectations, our mutual expectations around mm -hmm. fatal and significant risk management. So, so this will very much be the feature of how we expect um, us to collectively work together and how we'll contract in the future. Um, and we are doing the same for National Highways employees. We've been thinking about fatal risk and significant risk management in National Highways since 2020, actually. We set up our federal risk group back in 2021 and we've been really focusing on um, our people who work in high risk environments so our traffic officers inspectors we've got construction managers now site supervisors we, we share a lot of the same risks as the industry you know we are we have traffic officers they don't have ipvs our traffic officers they have tiddly cones traffic officer vehicle and some ppe and um, so actually we we think about this really really closely and we, we we're monitoring it exactly the same way um, and it is innovation it's engineering controls we've got some exciting projects on the go at the moment so incursion monitoring so we can kind of understand what's going on behind a traffic officer's 150 meter taper that's an opportunity to to look at what the interventions can be above the line so you know it's it, this is really really important work um, i also um reflect on the fact that 
we're looking at fatal risks as part of our whole safe systems as well. So our traffic officers operate within a safe system, within safe systems. It will be the same for your people as well. Um, so it's thinking about it more broadly and also thinking about how we apply significant risk management across all of our people, wherever they work in our in our businesses. So, so it, it's really got us thinking in our business in National Highways about how we apply that significant risk mentality. As you said, I, I wrote it down. Um, actually, it was that uh, that point about sort of wiping out all the noise um, and actually kind of really focusing in on the bits that really matter um, across all of your business. Um, so um, we're educating our traffic officers. You, you mentioned that as well, Andrew. We're educating our people on what fatal risk is about. I think that's important that that we all collectively go off and do that. Um, what we're focusing in, why it's important, and actually how to report it. There is actually a box in heart now that you can tick that says it's a fatal risk, um, a fatal risk type incident. So I think that's really focus, um, important to focus on as well. So um, in terms of next steps, Andrew, there's another slide, I think. Yeah, it's just to sort of bring you up to date. Um, so there's going to be a more in-depth technical webinar coming. It will be um, due in May, released in May. It's uh, being developed by the Supply Chain Safety Leadership Group um, and that's going to help your safety professionals um, and others in your business on how to kind of deliver this approach. Um, and we really do need to deliver this really important first leading indicator first because it's the foundation of everything that we're doing here um, and we're not going to be able to build on the significant risk groups um, if we don't um, get this piece of work done first and I've seen lots of volunteers um, in the chat to join or get involved in some of those groups as well and um, there are a number of groups up and running um, and um, I really loved in the chat as well, I think it was Anne-Marie, but I think there were a few others as well, sort of power of the share. Fantastic, lovely expression. Um, you know, we can't communicate this stuff enough, clearly. Um, we really need to get that out there. You know, all of the thinking that's going into here, all of the innovations that you've shared with us today, Andrew, so that that's sort of really exposed um, across industry and people kind of um, know what what the shape of this is and what they can do um, and how they can take some of this things, these things forward practically. So um, it's it's really exciting. I'm, I'm kind of really delighted to be um, supporting this and working alongside the Supply Chain Safety Lead Leadership Group in, in delivering it. So I don't have a lot more to say other than our corporate ambition continues to be zero harm by 2040. Um, and this is how the supply chains responded to it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think we're genuinely making some real progress here. And I'm really excited to see where it can go. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. Teresa, I don't want to hand back to yourself now. Uh, we've got 15 minutes and I'm, I believe we're going to open up to some uh, questions from the chat with um, Adam and Andrew and Mel. We are indeed. So um, having gone through the chat, there's probably just, just one that hasn't been answered yet. Um, and that was from Philip around, uh, is there a database available to share the significant risk and innovative controls um, and case studies if they use an implementation? I think the answer is not yet, um, Philip, but it is something that we as a supply chain safety leadership group are looking at in terms of how we can communicate all of this out for you um, and have somewhere that you can access all of the information. Um, and I think we've just had another one come into the chat. Um, lots of people keen to get involved in the group. Um, that is all the questions we've had so far. So if anybody has got anything, either you know, raise your hand or put into the chat. A stunned silence. <laughs> I think you've stunned them all. There we go. Um, so I'll hand back to you then, Andrew. Mr Sharp, would you like to close? You're on mute, Andrew. Yeah, th thanks for that, Andrew. Um, I think it's a fantastic piece of work that, that the supply chain safety leadership people are doing. And, you know, I've, I've been worked in maintenance and operations for 20 odd years now with the Highways Agency, Highways England, National Highways. And I think, you know, like yourself, Andrew's seen various things through the years. It's time to stop the things that have been going on for a long time. And I think together we can do that. It will require investment, it will require work, but I think we're, we're on that journey. And, and thanks for your support, Mel, from a National Highways perspective about what we're trying to do in supply chain. And it's great that we're doing that in full collaboration um, with National Highways. 
Um, and probably finally for me, thank you to um, oh, thank you to Adam. Yeah, thank you for that CEO perspective. Uh, I certainly recognise some of that there and something we've used in our own organisation that red is not bad. Red, red is a place for us to focus and I think in, in performance and I think if we can get that um, it, it sort of approach through all our things um, we'll be in a better place and so thank you for that CEO perspective Adam it was really good to sort of get that as well and in, in your journey so far um, and finally Teresa thank you for putting together and sorting all the admin today these things don't just happen um, so thank you for sort of hosting it and taking us through that so thank you you everyone and um, we'll get back to you in all the sort of comments um, and thank you for all the, the volunteers get involved in groups because that's great and the wider we can do this and um, the more chance we've got success in this space so thank you very much for that and have a good day everyone thank you everyone Bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you